so this is our first panel discussion of the day. This is sustainable and ethical uh, sourcing. Uh, we're joined by uh, Claire Hullett, who's Director of Partnerships and Alliances at EMEA Interos. Uh, we have uh, Rory Welsh, consultant at the Carbon Trust. And on the end, we have uh, Ross Burling, who's Managing Director at Starman Webster. So the way we're all going through things is we're going to be chatting our way through a few various points and questions. And uh, when we get towards the end, we will throw it open for any questions, both online and in the room as well. The microphone will, will come round. We'll, we'll do that around five to ten minutes towards the end. So that's what we're doing. But first of all, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to start things very simply with a, with a check of the state of play of where we are at the moment because post-COVID, it threw everything up in the air with su chi uh, supply chains, uh, sourcing. For you, where, where, I'll, I'll start with you, Claire, as you're closest to me. Where do you feel we are at the moment? Wh what's the, the current state of play in that, in that sense? I think we've had some huge challenges, as you say, and I think we're still, be, we're still feeling the effects on the supply chain of a whole range of things. So COVID obviously is still washing through the supply chain. Um, we're also looking at a whole lot of regulations coming in um, and delighted to be looking at th things like the German Supply Chain Act, which are really focusing our minds around sustainability. Um, and so I think there's a huge emphasis on the supply chain and our responsibility um, on, on our suppliers and um, the, the kind of the ethics and the sustainability within that. So I think we've got some interesting times coming, coming up, um, some challenges, but I, I, I look forward to us all to stepping up to the challenge. Challenges, I think that's something we could hear a lot of. Um, Rory, where, where do you stand on that and in terms of the current state of play and how you, you advise and consult with people? Yeah, of course. So. Within our practice, you know, it's helping corporates set science-based targets, net zero targets, the feasibility in reaching those. And really, since COVID, there's been such an increase in demand. So even though there may be, you know, a lot of these challenges from inflated prices of materials and services, those big players in the game are still setting ambitious targets. And that's where they're looking into their supply chain to then have the supply chain make the reductions for them through that collaboration. So although, you know, as I say, there is these challenges, it's still on the forefront of some of these larger corporates that can absorb some of these costs and still have, you know, their shareholders asking them to make these promises that they've made. Ross. Neil, I'll, uh, I'll be honest, I'm a farmer, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a sustainability expert, but uh, I mean, COVID in Australia has been challenging We've um, essentially been almost feels like cut off from the rest of the world. Uh, freight, freight is ongo an ongoing issue for us. We haven't had an issue with um, with produce being short. The reality is we've had a lot of produce flowing in the into country, but external it's very hard to ship. It's um, six to th you know pre-COVID four to six weeks to ship to the US. We're now looking at two to three months per container if you can get a container. And is that really a, a consistent problem, getting hold of them? When you're shipping something that has a limited shelf life, yes. So we're moving a product that can't sit on a, can't sit in a container on a port for more than a month at a time so that you're deteriorating the shelf life, just trying to move product. Was that something you foresaw? Did you think it was going to be that bad? Or oh, is that something geez. that's crept up on you a little bit? We've had, oh, like that's a very else. knowing smile there. <laughs> like everybody else, we've had two years of pain. You know, what comes next? And everything, if it ain't break, don't fix it. The problem with it, if it ain't break, don't fix it, there was a lot of things that were possibly almost broke. So what COVID did, exposed the, the weaker links. And that's what we found. And I think that's, for us, has been the check and adjust to keep finding those weak links and to try and look ahead is really difficult. Mm. Now, now that the issue is sourcing people, um, labour is, is a consistent, consistent theme or lack of labour is a consistent theme throughout the country. There was definite nodding from both of you there at the talk of weak links and exposing those weak links. Was that, Claire, was that something you, you particularly noticed? Definitely. Just as you were speaking, I'm just thinking about kind of the climate emergency now. And if you look at some of the yields from the crops that are coming out of Europe at the moment, and I was wondering if it's affecting you in Australia, that not only do we have the, um, 
the issues around supply chain and all the impediments to you know, containers and shipping and COVID and whatever. But I think the next problem we're having is those yields are so low and um, so there's going to be so much competition for the produce that we can supply um, with, with the d a decreased ability sometimes to actually get those to the right place and, and then looking at scope two and three of the supply of the manufacturers. I think it's, it's kind of all, something of a perfect storm coming our way. So you work as a consultant in, in actually in this, this area. Are more people coming to you for advice now in this, in this sort of position? Yeah, definitely. There's, there's been such an increase since COVID, um, mostly from the larger corporates that do have, you know, they've got a lot of their competitors setting targets and they're saying, how can we either, you know, be on the same level as them, benchmarking against everyone else, or how, how can we be the most ambitious? And it's really about that engagement with the supply base. Um, is, is the, really the key there. And that's what, you know, when you're, when you're doing a kind of scope three footprint, so when you're looking at that value chain and the upstream and the downstream of your products, the main focus, and usually for most companies, the material areas are coming from your purchase goods and services. That's the embodied emissions within those materials that you're purchasing um, or products that you're needing for, for development of your own product. And that's a lot of the work that we do is then, you know, what level of data do they have? And then the next movement after that is how can we help that engagement, help that collaboration? Do you ever hear any horror stories, no names needed, <laughs> of people who are coming to you looking for advice and you think, my word, you are, you are behind the curve here. You've got a lot of work to do. Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know names, that's fine. <laughs> my colleague's very generous. I just realised we're a customer. <laughs> No, so no. What, what sort of things do you hear then? You know, let's, let's give some people some reassurance that the fact that they may well be on the li right lines. So right now you're seeing a lot of companies coming in and actually starting at the very start. So hopefully here we know, you know we have your own operations. This is your scope one and two emissions. This is the, the combustion of fuels within your office for heating. This is the combustion of fuels within your company vehicles. The purchased electricity uh, that you have for the lighting and uh, any fugitive emissions from HVAC systems. So generally, most companies are at that level where you've calculated your own operations. You might be reporting that for, um, it may be a requirement that you have to do it within your annual report, which in some countries it is, depending on the size of your company. And this next step is that scope three. And you see a lot of companies coming in trying to make this scope three footprint the most advanced scope three footprint it can be within three months of a time. So they'll come to us in 2022 and say, we don't really have any data for 2018, 2019, but we want to try and make this a footprint that we can make decisions on. And you have to say, let's step back for a second. For you to collect all that data from your suppliers is going to at least take a year. So let's first start with your spend and then just do a little bit of mapping of your spend to categories and you want to really see where your most material areas within your scope three footprint are, and then you delve in. Then you look at, okay, where can we engage with the supply base? Where can we actually get that quantities of materials from them? And, and what you want to go to is a place where you have a lot of collaboration, a lot of engagement within your supply base. They are also doing the work. They also have targets set, and you're both on the same journey into getting there. And if you were to work with a supplier that was providing you quantities of materials that you may be purchasing from them, but they also, were, they also were conducting product footprints on their materials that they were able to provide you, then that's really the best, the best place to be in. Well, Ross, as a supplier, you, know, you, you work across many, many different markets. Are you finding there's a lot more demand for information about your approach and your sustainability credentials? So I've got to say we're slightly behind the eight ball there that um, there, there isn't a lot of requests for information around sustainability, which is possibly not what everybody wants to hear at a conference like this. Well, let's, let's be honest. We're here to be honest and, and look at things. And that, that's the reality of the markets we're in. Um, in talking that, we've, I guess, for, for, as an example, 20 years ago we decided that we couldn't use pesticides or herbicides and needed to reduce our diesel footprint. And so we, um, we bred insects 
we were a farm of breeding insects, and so we bred a trigger gamma and a trichopoda wasp. Uh, and we bred those insects with the sole aim of reducing chemicals and pesticides because we had one of our owners with prostate cancer. So, it, so we had no idea what we were doing, we had no plan, but we had to do it we, because we knew it was the right thing to do. So we've lived on trading with our suppliers for the right thing to do because we did the right thing. So I guess we, we didn't have a framework though to, to talk about it. We just simply discussed these ad hoc things that we'd done in terms of trying to be a better farmer because we are good farmers. That it was just framing up how do, you, how do, how do we frame up the good things we were doing as farmers. But 20 years ago, were you having people saying, why are you doing that? What's the point? Is that going to hit your bottom line? Was that the sort of response you were getting from people? So 20 years ago, it was unheard of not to use a pesticide on a farm. And 20 years ago, it was unheard of a, of a farmer becoming an uh, entomologist breeding insects. So it was a, re it was a real journey uh, and a stretch. I got to say, I was quite a lot younger back <laughs> 20 years ago. And it, was a, it was a stretch but would do it again any day. And it, and it leads us into the next conversation of the transition now into ESG and sustainability, that we just have to have a plan. There's plenty of people who absolutely know what to, know what to do. And so it's, it's just, it's now just, I guess we're actually, I was gonna say following, but it's t it now even feels, still feels like we're a leader in the field. It was nice to sort of be ahead of the curve a little bit, but um, if, we, if we move on, um, Claire, when it comes to the resources that are available for businesses that are wanting to build a more transparent um, supply list and, and get this sort of thing moving, where, where should they start? Because as, well, as you've just touched on there, it's such a huge thing to feel like you need to address. So without having all the answers, <laughs> um, I think that what we're trapped on is the, the data is absolutely key. Um, but of course, you know, just kind of getting that data is difficult and you are needing to rely on data, and it's a kind of it's a 360 degree view. So you, you're looking at data that, that we do as a company from kind of open source data, you're looking at the company's own internal systems, what data you can get from there, but you also really have to collaborate with your suppliers um, and, and have that kind of both for innovation and to prevent issues in the supply chain and really to work together. This has got to be a team game. No one's going to solve it as a, as, as a one item. Um, so it's, it's kind of using that data, making that data visible, and, and really one of the earlier speakers was speaking about kind of having to be really honest about here are the pitfalls, these are the opportunities, these are the things we're not doing so well. Um, so, so really that's kind of getting as much of that data together. But then for some of the work that we're doing with the likes of Carbon Trust is beginning to, to begin to help organizations be thinking about what are their key processes um, and which are their key suppliers? Because you've got to start somewhere. You're not going to resolve this thing overnight. And where can you begin to kind of move that needle in critical suppliers or critical um, critical paths within the organization? And, and how do you then begin to measure some of those? And a lot of our clients, when, when looking at ESG, are, are taking a call on which component they're going to work with. So we're finding our clients in North America are looking at slave labor and they're looking at gender diversity. Our clients in Europe are looking more at carbon and looking getting to, to, to a net zero position. And honestly, our, our kind of our clients in APAC are looking at some of the data security issues and, and cyber and how that kind of has a knock-on effect um, in, in, the, in the supply chain. Um, and, and so identify what are the targets that you're trying to reach, what is the data that you can collate from a whole range of sources, um, and then begin to set those kind of targets as to how can you, how can you get there, how you're reporting on them, and, and using some of the, the collaboration with that kind of visibility to look into your supply chain. You know, the other component, we're having a question preparing for this at the moment, and I'm really surprised that Ross is not getting questions from his big customers to say, you've done the most amazing job. We want to buy more of our product from you. You've, you've got the right kind of carbon footprint. How else can we be working with you? How can we expand? And Ross is saying he's not getting those kind of questions. It's like they are not looking at what you're achieving and how to leverage that, which is surprising. Mm. Indeed. Uh, we'll get to your questions uh, very, very shortly, and we'll get to the, any online ones as well. So if you are joining us uh, remotely, um, do get your questions in using the uh, the app that's detailed on the website. Um, 
Rory, I'll, I'll just ask you before we move on, what advice would you have for businesses that are trying to, to make that start and, and, and managing with, with Scope 3? I've got the perfect plan. Perfect plan. Excellent. So let's, <laughs> let's assume... This is where everyone starts scribbling furiously. There you go. <laughs> let's assume that, uh, and this is TMing it myself, so let's assume that you have done a, a, a Scope 1 and 2 footprint. To look into Scope 3, you want to first by looking at the different categories. There's 15 categories that are set out by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol for Scope 3. And the ones that you have the most influence over is the easiest to then do a screening, do a footprinting on. And this is your waste in your own operations, and this is business travel. Now, you see a lot of companies that, um, I was just in this room before, and there was a description, um, kind of comparison between net zero and carbon neutrality. And obviously, carbon neutrality is, has been quite big in the past mm. 10 or so years, and net zero is getting much larger now. But a lot of companies carbon uh, become carbon neutral for their scope one and two, plus business travel, plus waste, because it's the easiest ones that they can then actually look at. And within waste, that's really, you know, you work in an office, you have a manufacturing site, likely you may have a third party waste contractor, they can provide you with waste transfer notes that has quantity and that has end of life fate. Simple footprinting is that bays publish their conversion factors, emission factors every year that's free on their website and you can just look at the different waste types and apply that to the quantities of waste that you have. That's category five, that's a done. For business travel, now, assuming you have business travel, likely your employees are going to be trying to get their expenses back, and they'll be putting in claims, so you'll have the spend in your financial system, and you'll have, likely or hopefully, the different modes of transport. And then there's two bits of required data there, and the next step is then just to ask for that distance. Or potentially you have a third party that deals with all your business travel, and they should be able to provide you a report that has distance, sometimes it actually has emissions in there, and spend for your reporting year. Now, they're the, the two most, I suppose, influential you have at the moment, but looking into where the more material aspects are, again, it's that purchase goods and services, the embodied emissions of the materials that you're purchasing or the services that you're procuring. And the best thing to do is actually just do a free online tool. So the Scope 3 Evaluator tool by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, free to use on their website. That basically just takes your spend, you map it by different categories, and you have this nice screening of where your emissions lie within your footprint. It's not, you know, it's not a full inventory, but that then allows you and going to then what Claire said about the key suppliers. You know, you can look at your top 10 suppliers by spend, and then you're just going in for that engagement. You're saying, let's just put, put in a conversation. This is our journey. This is where we want to be. Are you aligned to that? Do you have any information? You can even, you don't even have to have that conversation first. You can look on their annual reports and see if they have a target. If they have a target, likely they have a base year of inventory of emissions that you can then use and apply to your own footprint. Then beyond that, I'd say the key is having a sustainability champion within the workforce. You know, a lot of companies will start with the finance team, procurement team. It's totally fine. You have, you have that data there. It's a good person to have. But having someone that has the eagerness as well as the resource to help is good. And then also having that conversation with, you know, the C-suite and senior management just to get them on board as early as possible. And that's... That's, that's the plan. plan. That's a good plan. Right. I appreciate there may well be questions from the room. There is a microphone that can come round. So if anyone wishes to go first, do we have any questions for the panel, please? Who's going to be my hero today? <laughs> no, oh, yeah, if we can get a microphone round to the front here. It always takes the first person to go. Everyone's too polite. Hmm. Thank you. I don't know if... It, oh, it's on now. It is now. <laughs> um, I'm Madeline Kahn. I work for Page Group, the recruitment company. Um, my question is around incentives for suppliers. So say you, you know, you've done all of this kind of calculation, you know where your big suppliers are, and you're ready to engage. How, can you just give a flavour, I guess, of some good ways to kind of incentivise your, your suppliers to change the... I don't know carrot or stick or a bit of both? In, I, could, I can start on this. 
So I suppose the way I generally see it in working with larger corporates is that during that engagement, there is an opportunity, which is to update your kind of supplier code of conduct and then kind of also enforce that they do supply you with data, which may not be the most collaborative, but it may start to happen more often with some of these suppliers that, you know, some of these companies that have set targets for, you know, to have their own suppliers set their own targets. So a lot of them say, you know, we're going to say 40% of our uh, purchase goods and services by suppliers will have their own science-based targets by 2025, 2027, whenever it might be. And in order for them to actually achieve that and achieve that target, they're going to have to start enforcing their suppliers, either working with them or enforcing them to have targets set by that date. So that's really the, I suppose, that kind of top-down approach where they're just saying, this is what you have to do to work with us. But obviously, that only works if you have huge influence. On the other end, I can leave it to the other panelists here to answer that question. <laughs> I'm glad to come in from, from the kind of the top down. So um, we do a lot of work in the MOD and the Department of Defense in the US, and they are stipulating for any companies working with them that there has to be a 15% sustainability um, component to all the big RFPs and RFIs that they put out. So they really are demanding that companies step up to the, to the plate. And further down the line, we're finding um, a lot of companies are working with their third-party risk management teams, so working with all their vendors, and are, are having exactly those kinds of, if not stipulations, but requests. And then they're beginning to measure those. And then that comes back to the whole thing around really what you're measuring. If it's a big enough um, customer, the suppliers are going to start responding. Um, and then, of course, the third thing that we're seeing a lot of is the innovation working together. And so these organizations are understanding their suppliers are absolutely key to them, and they're having a struggle too. So how do you begin to innovate? How do you work together? How are you transparent around some of those kind of things? How do you share best practice? And so we found a lot of those kind of community capabilities almost that are taking away the stick component and saying, together we have to do this. It's for, it's for the planet and it's for our businesses together. How can we support? excuse me, support and what can we do? It's sometimes making that first move, essentially. Reaching out. Yeah. Anything you wanted to add on that, Ross? Or? Yeah, I'd say we don't have a stick. <laughs> um, and we don't need a stick. If you're missing this conversation, you're really missing out on... I mean, the world is changing, it's moving, and it's, it's, it's not the ticket to play the game. It will be mandatory to, to um, have an ESG policy or, or understand your sustainability. So you can't miss this conversation. No stick required. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have another one at the back there. If we can get the microphone around there, please, Luke. Just in the middle at the back there. Hi, um, I'm Daisy Ash from Oak Dean Hollands. We're a small sustainability consultancy. Um, we're working a lot with more the furniture sector and a lot of their suppliers, even though they're based in the UK, their actual supply chains all in, particularly around in Asia. And I think what we've just heard is the fact that it's really this like sort of connection and collaboration only really touching tier one and there are a lot of themselves are tier one suppliers to a lot of the big multinationals. I was just wondering if the opinion, if the panel's got an opinion about how to really reach these tier two, tier three suppliers, which is actually where a lot of this carbon impact lies, because I think we're still just getting to just the low level. We're actually not really getting to where those uh, materials are being manufactured or food being produced. I can remember that, yeah. So not wanting to do a push for the company, please come to our stand. Um, one of the things that we do is really we've pulled together a whole range of data to try and help organizations see that kind of ESG impact to, to, to hopefully the nth degree in their supply chain. Um, and, we tr and what we offer is the capability to understand um, all those kind of ESG factors through each of the tiers. So who are your tier ones and who supplies them and who supplies them, et cetera. Um, and it's difficult. Um, and and w what some of our organizations who are working with are saying, we're almost giving them the heavy lifting to get that visibility into the data. 
and then you're going to need a team on the ground and you're going to need consultants to work with you to begin to identify which of those suppliers are actually burdening you and potentially carry, taking down your reputation for some of the ESG non-compliance that they're carrying. Um, and you've got to then start targeting them and looking at alternative suppliers. And that, again, was part of the question to Ross, where good suppliers and good, you know, good, good growers, people are going to be start chasing after them. Um, and, and how do you begin to contract with them and almost ring fence those because they are going to be gold dust, absolute gold dust? Yeah, I'll just add to that and say, I think it's key to, it's e easy enough to, to engage, or maybe not easy enough, but easy enough in theory to engage your tier one. But beyond that, it's more about joining a coalition. So I'm not sure what there is for furniture or kind of upholstery, but within the apparel sector, you have the Sustainable Apparel Coalition who, you know, I think you may have to pay a fee to join that potentially, but they have um, informa information available to, to help you build your own footprint, but they also share expertise and come together and try and force, or not force, sorry, uh, engage with the those those further suppliers within the kind of apparel and uh, retail sector. So that's another step to make is is looking for these opportunities to come together to then make change that way. Ross, anything you wanted to add on that? Oh, there was. So uh, apart from uh, being described as gold dust, which, yeah. you know, brightens up anyone's day. <laughs> Um, I'd add the comment that we totally restructured our business to become a, a gate to plate business to, to remove the supply chain inefficiencies and remove and trying to understand our supply chain. For us, it's, it's a whole lot easier to go to Costco or Lidl or whoever it might be and deal directly and to be able to and have total control over all our numbers. So that's a very difficult... The, the question you asked is perplexing and the answer is probably even more so and it's something we couldn't work out ourselves how we're going to address, just simply because it was, we, I thought we were starting from a very low spot. So our business is structured around controlling the complete supply chain and having all our own numbers. Okay, we have time for one more question if there's, yeah, we have one more there because uh, then it is lunchtime. And from my experience, if you hold up a room of delegates wanting their lunch, it doesn't end well. Um, so where was the, that last question? hand just went up. Thank you. So I'll just check it's on. Um, yeah, I was just, because um, we're hearing about like just focusing on your kind of top 10, like most strategic suppliers and stuff. With there being kind of 2025 commitments and 2030 commitments and it kind of being very much almost a third of the way through like this decade where we need to act, is there an element of risk in just focusing on the top 10 st most strategic suppliers, whereas if you're focusing on more of your supply base and aligning them to your mission, um, perhaps you're engaging those suppliers early that might be um, a little bit less responsive than your most strategic. I just wondered if that was um, a risk or, or not that was being considered. Good question. Yeah, I would say definitely a risk. If you think about near-term targets, 2025, 2030, you know, it's, it's where the, the majority of decarbonisation should be happening, but then the net zero element, 2050, the latest, is at least a 90% reduction in your value chain, it's got one, two, and three. And I suppose when I was discussing the top 10, that's in your first, that's your first year. And beyond that, yeah, right, even, even if that is your target to only include those top 10, because that might be 40, 50%, that's almost just a starting point. That's a starting point. The, the, yeah. okay. uh, and obviously, a lot of companies don't have the resource to then engage with everyone in the first year. So it's just about building on what you've done every year. It's about gaining and improving on the data collection and then also just like bringing everyone together and you know having that journey together and uh, try, trying to get there. So definitely a risk to only focus on the big ones. Okay. Well, I think that is about all the time we have before lunch now. So uh, my thanks to Claire, to Rarity and to Ross. Um, your insight's been very, very interesting. And hopefully the people will actually start asking that question of you. That's, sure, uh, they will. That, was, uh, that, was, uh, that, was a, that, that shocked me a little bit, but hopefully they will. So a round of applause for our panel, please. Thank you.